Thanks very much. Um, Sophie, let's start at the beginning. Um, how did you get the part of being Ag Agatha Christie 2.0, effectively the modern day crime maestro? Uh, well, I should point out, first of all, that I'm definitely not Agatha Christie. Um, and it is actually something that people ask me. I can tell sometimes when people approach me at events that they don't quite know how to phrase the question they want to ask. And often people sort of sidle up to me and say, so are you Agatha Christie now? And I have to say, no, no, nobody is Agatha Christie now. I'm still just me. Um, but how it came about was um, really by a huge coincidence of timing, basically. My literary agent happened to be having a meeting with Harper Collins, who are Agatha Christie's publishers and have been for a long time. And this meeting was nothing to do with Agatha Christie and nothing to do with me. Um, but my agent was sitting next to a shelf of Agatha Christie books. Uh, and I think he was finding this meeting, whatever it was about, a bit boring, uh, because he was looking at the spines of all these Agatha Christie books, and he remembered that I am a huge Agatha Christie fan. And so he interrupted the editor that he was having this meeting with and said, hey, you know what you ought to do? You ought to ask my client, Sophie Hanna, who's a massive Agatha Christie fan, to write a continuation novel of some kind for Agatha Christie. Uh, so he rang me and told me that he'd suggested this. And I just froze when I heard this. I just thought, oh, no. Uh, because, firstly, it was just a bit embarrassing. I knew, or I thought I knew, that the Christie family did not want anything like that to happen. And, in fact, at the time, they were famous for not wanting anything like that to happen. Um, and if my agent had only asked me before making this suggestion, I could have told him that there was no point. Um, so anyway, I was a bit, I was a bit cross, uh, but there's just no point with my agent. There's no point saying in future, please, could you not? He just, he's a law unto himself. He does exactly what he wants, and he is brilliant, uh, and that's why he gets away with it. But anyway, so he rang me and told me he'd done this, and I said, okay, what, what did this Harper Collins editor say? Uh, and my agent said, oh well, the editor said, no way is this going to happen. It's a definite no. It's a complete non-starter. The Christie family would hate for anything like this to happen. So I was like, great. So I said, right, if only you'd asked me, I could have told you that this is a response you'd get. And I was actually quite annoyed with him. I felt as though, you know, out of nowhere, he had created an opportunity for me to be rejected for something uh, that I would never have thought to apply for in the first place. Uh, so that was a bit annoying. Anyway, I soon forgot about it. And I thought, you know, my situation is no different from it, how it was before. I wasn't writing Agatha Christie continuation novels yesterday, and I won't be tomorrow, and that's all fine. Then the next day, he rings again, my agent, and he says, uh, well, anyway, the Christie family want to meet you now. And I said, really? That seems strange, because I thought we all agreed that this was definitely not going to happen. And he said, yeah, I know, weird, isn't it? I said, right, am I to infer from that that you have failed to find out why? the Christie family want to meet me. He said, well, we have to go to the meeting, don't we? Because they're the Christie family, so I guess we'll find out. So I went along to this meeting thinking that I was going to be served with an injunction uh, saying on no account to go anywhere near Agatha Christie or any of her characters. Uh, and I was totally planning to blame my agent for the whole thing whose fault it entirely was. Anyway, I walk into this room, this big mahogany polished table, and at the far end of it are several members of the Christie family, uh, but luckily there were also people from HarperCollins in the room and they had some basic communication skills. So I soon found out that what had happened was this extraordinary coincidence. So basically the day after his meeting with the editor, um, the same editor who met my agent had his regular quarterly meeting with the Christie family. And Matthew Pritchard, who at the time, he's Agatha's grandson, and he at the time was chairman of Agatha Christie Limited, he opened that meeting by saying to the HarperCollins editor, this is going to surprise you, but we've decided now is the time to think about a continuation novel. And the editor could hardly believe it, because for about 20 years, he'd been saying to the family, please consider a continuation novel, and they'd been going, no, no, we're not considering it. And suddenly, the day after my agent suggested me, 
Matthew Pritchard says we want to do it. So it really was just pure chance. I like the idea that you went to a meeting with the Christie family and it was a mystery. <laughs> yes, exactly. It really uh, was a mystery. I want to talk, though, about your preparation for, for Poirot because I think he's a name many of us know, but we're perhaps uncertain of a few details before, you know, beyond him being, you know, a monsieur with a moustache. <laughs> Did you do a lot of research where you're already incredibly familiar with that character? How did you how did you basically go from that meeting where there was, you know, an assent to the idea to coming up with a plot and and, and you know, working out where Poirot was going to be placed? Well, the best kind of research, you know, when I first started writing, uh, I used to decide what story I wanted to tell and then sometimes be a bit daunted by the amount and the type of research. I needed to do, but as I got more experienced and slightly more shrewd about it all, I realised that the best kind of research is the kind that you've already done, not thinking of it as work. Mm -hmm. And I had already read Agatha Christie's entire published output at least four times. Um, so, I mean, I really am an obsessive person. So. You know, when it was suggested to me and when I found out that the Christies actually wanted this to happen, I thought, great, I actually feel that this is something I'm kind of really well prepared for without knowing that I was going to be preparing for that. What I did do, though, was reread all of the Poirot novels again because I'd always read them previously just for fun uh, and not sort of analyzing them and thinking about the different components and the different elements. So I, I reread them all from a sort of more analytic point of view. I also re-watched the David Suchet TV versions. Uh, but actually, I, I relied far more on the books. The, I mean, I think David Suchet's Poirot is wonderful, but he's a slightly different version from the Poirot in the books. And in particular, his speech patterns are very different in the books. Uh, from how they are in the Suchet version. So, so that was my homework, really, and it was, you know, great fun. Um, I never do any work that isn't fun these days. Um, so, yeah, so that was, that was how I prepared. Um, and a lot of the... I mean, it was so funny. Even when my agent suggested it to me while telling me it wasn't going to happen in that first phone call, I kind of immediately knew that actually, yes, it wasn't going to happen, but if the Christies were to want me to do that, I could imagine, even at that early stage, doing it. And I, I knew that I couldn't do it for any other writer. So even writers that I love, like, say, Ruth Rendell, I'm a huge fan of Ruth Rendell, but I couldn't write a continuation Inspector Wexford novel, for example. But with Agatha Christie, because she was the first crime writer that I discovered, I, I first discovered her and read her when I was 12, I'd read everything she'd published by the time I was 14 and regarded myself as one of the world's leading Christie experts. <laughs> um, so I kind of felt, yeah, I've internalized from a very young age this kind of blueprint, the Agatha Christie blueprint for what the ideal crime novel should be and do. Uh, and I also realized that I'd kind of, in a closeted way, been writing according to that blueprint anyway. So long before I was asked to write Poirot, I was writing contemporary psychological thrillers, which on the surface seemed very unlike Agatha Christie. But actually, when you look at the elements, or when I thought about the elements of my contemporary thrillers, that sort of Christie blueprint was very firmly there. I mean, just to give you one example, Christie loved and constantly went back to this idea that crime novels should begin not just with a kind of ordinary mystery, like, you know, here is Fred, Fred is dead, who murdered Fred? Well, it's either got to be Maureen, Jane, or Peter, because they're the only three people in the room. That's a kind of ordinary mystery. You don't know who did it and why, but you pretty much know what happened. Someone didn't like Fred very much, and it's one of those three. Um, Agatha Christie understood that if you want to really crank up the suspense and make readers desperate to know what's going on and unable to put the book down, that it helps to start with a much weirder mystery than that. So A Murder is Announced, one of the best Miss Marple novels, begins with a murder being advertised in the local newspaper. I mean, it literally says in print, 
a murder is announced, exclamation mark. Come along to Laburnum Cottage at 6.30 tonight. A murder will take place. And you see all the villagers going, oh, well, I suppose we'd better go. They might be serving tea and scones. Uh, and that makes you so much more desperate to know what's going on because you cannot actually think of any explanation. Uh, same with Sleeping Murder, another, another Miss Marple, where a woman goes to a house that she's, she knows she's never been to that part of the world ever before, and yet she walks into this house and she knows every detail, and yet that is apparently impossible. And as a reader, you just cannot imagine why that would happen. So I realised that many of my contemporary thrillers start with that kind of ultra-weird mystery where hopefully the reader cannot guess what on earth could be going on. And just, I mean, like... You know, for example, one of my crime novels called The Other Half Lives begins with a man confessing to the murder of a woman who isn't dead. And no matter how hard the police try to convince him that he can't possibly have killed her, because look, she's over there and she's totally fine, he keeps insisting, this man, that whatever anyone thinks they know, he murdered that woman seven years earlier. Um, another of my books, Lasting Damage, begins with a woman seeing a dead body in an estate agent's photograph of a house for sale as part of the virtual tour of the house. And yet when that room reappears, the body's gone. And, you know, that's just one example, but I realised that in so many ways I was already writing Christie-inspired crime novels, and so being asked to write a Poirot novel, it, it really did feel like being invited to come out of the closet in a certain way. Um, I mean, he's the only fictional character who's ever had an obituary on the front of the New York Times. That's right, isn't it? I yes. was looking um, to see what that was. And that in it, I mean, it, some of it's actually quite funny because, again, it's, it suggests a lot of things about Poirot that we don't associate. If you don't know him incredibly well, you don't know. It's like, there's things like um, he was carried from his bedroom to the public lounge at a nursing home in Essex wearing a wig and false moustaches to mask the signs of age that offended his vanity. That's part <laughs> of his obituary. But th that made me interested as to the monogram murders, which is the first of the Poirot books that yes. you wrote. How, did he, how then does he come to be in London solving those, solving those murders? Did you decide to you know, make these kind of cases that we didn't, mid-career cases that we didn't know had taken place as opposed to, was there ever any idea of you know, Poirot re-emerging from the dead and it being set no. in a modern environment? <laughs> no, um, I mean, that was one of the things that came up at that first meeting with the Christie family. Once we'd all got over the shock of you know, me discovering they actually might want me to do this and them discovering that there was someone out there waiting to do the thing they wanted done. Uh, one of the first things they asked me was, what would you want to do with Poirot if we asked you to write this book? And I said, what do you mean, what would I want to do with him? Write a book about him? And they said, yes, but would you want to, for example, bring him into the 21st century? Would you want to give him a love life? of any kind. Now, I hadn't thought about any of those things because I had entered that room being certain this would never happen, so I, I hadn't given it much thought. But as soon as I thought about it, I thought, no, that would all be terrible. I definitely didn't want a 21st century Poirot. Um, I'm not generally a fan of taking something brilliant and classic and kind of wrecking it by being inappropriately innovative with it. Um, so I think, you know, people who love a series character, especially one like Poirot, who's starred in, you know, 36 novels, he's so established, he's so Poirot-ish. Um, I don't think his fans and his readers would want to have him Googling the suspects and sending Snapchats and doing Instagram. And I mean, I think it would be awful. And as a Poirot fan myself, I would hate it if somebody did that. Um, so I said to Matthew, I said, no, you know, readers of series novels want to have exactly the right blend of reassuring familiar and new and exciting. And it just seemed obvious to me that the reassuring familiar aspect should be Poirot, who should remain absolutely Agatha Christie's Poirot, and the new and exciting element should come from the new mystery that I create for him to solve. Um, so, so that was... Um, you know, we all agreed. Matthew was hugely relieved when I said that. Um, and 
So he is... The, the two I've written so far, The Monogram Murders and Closed Casket, are both set in 1929, which is kind of classic Golden Age Poirot timing. Uh, and the reason we all agreed on that, that year is because we didn't want to bring him back from the dead because that would be silly. That would be like Dallas, if anyone watched Dallas, when Bobby Ewing turned out not to have died and it was all a dream. Uh, and Dallas never recovered from that. Um, so we didn't want to bring him back from the dead. We also didn't want to have a kind of prequel set before the mysterious affair at Styles, which is Agatha's first Poirot novel, because that sort of felt wrong. You know, Styles is well known as being the first Poirot novel, so it would have felt too inappropriate to, to sort of say, actually, there's one set before that. Uh, so luckily, there were four years between 1928 and 1932 when Agatha didn't write any Poirot novels. And so Poirot is unaccounted for during that period. So I thought, right, perfect. And the family liked that idea as well. So however many Poirot novels I end up writing, they will all be set between 1928 and 1932. So there you are, day one, you know, writing as Agatha Christie. Was there anything different that you, you, know, you felt you had to do in order to be... You were not writing as Agatha Christie, but you're taking on somebody else's character, so it's to some extent different from what you've been doing. You know, do you, did you do anything different? Did you have an Agatha outfit that you wrote in? Was there any sort of change in your mindset when you sat down at your, your keyboard that day? Um, I didn't have an Agatha outfit. What I did do, and actually this was, again, a coincidence because I'd arranged this long before I had that phone call from my agent. Agatha Christie had a beautiful, huge kind of mansion of a holiday home in Devon called Greenway. And for a long time, the Christie family owned it. And then they gave it as a gift to the National Trust in return for the National Trust investing lots of money to turn it into, to restore the building and to turn it into a kind of official Agatha Christie museum. And when the National Trust did that, they kept the top floor of the house to be a guest apartment that they could rent out. So two years before I came to be writing the Poirot novel, somebody told me, you know, did you know you can rent an apartment um, and go on holiday in Agatha Christie's holiday home. So I was like, I'm there as soon as I possibly can be. So I booked it, and because it was hugely in demand, I booked it for a year and a half in advance. And so when Matthew and I agreed that I would be writing the monogram murders, I had to confess um, that I had this holiday booked in Agatha's holiday home. And I said, look, I just want to tell you, this was, you know, from ages ago. I don't want you to think that as soon as we agree on this book that I'm, I'm stalking you and, you know, hanging out in your, your family abode. Um, so because of that weird, another weird coincidence, I ended up writing most of the plan for the monogram murders while staying at Greenway, Agatha Christie's holiday home. And I had this beautiful bedroom with an enormous portrait of Agatha on the wall. And I would literally, every night when everyone else went to sleep, because I'm a bit of a night owl, I would get my laptop and sit up in bed and write an another bit of the plan and Agatha would be there looming over me on the wall. <laughs> That's um, marvellous serendipity. Um, I mean, I'm curious about, I want to just ask you more about, you were saying that you wanted to have the familiar, but there would be new mysteries that probably would be you know, engaged in solving. Were there also, when you, when you had read a lot of the Christie books and when you were deciding the tone and the language that you were going to use, was there turns of phrases, were there attitudes that Poirot had that you thought, I don't you know, whether or not he had those when she was writing them, that was the voice of the day, I don't want to replicate those now. I mean, the ones I'm kind of thinking of, I noticed that he, he had a secretary called Felicity Lemon, whom he had described as unbelievably ugly and incredibly efficient. And you kind of think, right, like, maybe it was okay to speak about women like that when... You know, that was like Poirot being, speaking about his sexuality then. Would you have felt, did you consciously think, I don't want to be writing particular things that feel uncomfortable for me now? Um, Miss Lemon isn't actually in my Poirot novels. She may be in the next one. I, I've just agreed to write two more. Uh, so they will be appearing in 2018 and 2020. Um, the only character that Agatha invented that's in my two that I've written so far is Poirot himself. Um, and 
as you said before, I'm not trying to write as Agatha Christie. The way I actually approached it, because I wanted to write an Agatha Christie-ish book that would appeal to Agatha Christie fans, and with that sort of Christie blueprint running underneath it, uh, but I didn't want to write as her, because I don't think any writer can or should copy the style of another. So the way I got round that was to create a new sidekick for Poirot. So instead of Hastings, who narrates every book he's in, and so I didn't want to try and do his voice and get it wrong, because his voice is Agatha's prose style. Uh, I invented a, a new sidekick for Poirot, uh, a Scotland Yard policeman called Edward Catchpool, and he narrates both novels. And that seemed to me to be a fairly sensible way to approach the fact that, yes, these are Poirot novels, but they're Poirot novels in a different voice. In terms of what I did and didn't feel Poirot could say, I mean, in, in some of Agatha's books, there were things that characters said that were very much of their time. Yeah. Um, often, though, she did use those kind of statements to show what was wrong with the character. You know, she's often wrongly criticised as being classist and xenophobic. Um, more often than not, what she does is have characters being classist and xenophobic. So you'll have, you know, upper class British Aristo type characters saying, oh, well, you don't need to bother listening to her. She's foreign and she's only a servant. And the reader then gets a signal, like, oh, okay, so this character's dismissing the testimony of that character. And often it's that character who turns out to have the important information. Poirot himself is regularly dismissed and derided and belittled because he's a funny looking foreigner. Um, and of course, he's better and more brilliant than everybody else. Um, so I think Agatha was often sort of satirizing the sort of complacent assumptions. In terms of whether I'd have prior, I mean, I, I don't think it's offensive for a character in a book to describe another character as ugly, for example. I, I don't think that's a specifically gender, gendered term. So. Um, I suppose if I was writing a book and I wanted one character to observe that another was ugly, that could be a man about a woman or a woman about a man. So I, I don't regard that as innately offensive. So yes, I probably would use that. What I wouldn't do is attach the description of ugliness to a particular kind of person in case, because you've always got to think your readers might have that physical characteristic. So I wouldn't have Poirot saying, what an ugly person with frizzy hair and glasses, because I thought if I read a book where someone with frizzy hair and glasses was described as ugly, I might go, hey, that's me you're talking about. So, uh, um, but yeah, I, I think, I think um, you've got to allow your characters to be kind of convincingly judgmental about the other characters in the book. Um, I'm, I'm also curious about your female characters. I mean, um, I read and enjoyed Monogram Murders, and there's quite a lot of strong female characters. Did you want to surround Poirot with those? I mean, Nancy Duquesne, if that's how you pronounce it, the artist who's an, an artist of some renown, and Fee Spring, who's like, a, you know, his great insight, seems to be a detective to be to some extent. Did you want to have the, the mysteries populated by you know, pretty strong female characters? Not consciously, and in fact, that had never occurred to me until you said that. I think, you know, everyone has a kind of writing that comes naturally and easily to them and a kind that they'd have to kind of strain for. And I think because I'm a, a, a occasionally stroppy and fairly opinionated and probably quite a strong character and I happen to be female, I think a lot of my female characters come across as sort of maybe they're kind of versions of me. And when I write a character who's very unlike me, like, for example, Jenny in The Monogram Murders, who is not the sort of woman I am at all, she's much more sort of dithery-seeming, um, I find that very hard. Um, but no, it wasn't a conscious decision. I do think that if your characters are strong and interesting, or even weak and interesting... I mean, Jenny is an interesting, weak character, and her weakness almost becomes a strength. Um, you've just got more to work with, the more your characters have about them. Um, but I do sometimes get moaned at by readers in my, not so much in the Poirot's actually, but in my contemporary thrillers, 
I would say that each one has a female protagonist who in some way, either at the beginning of the book or throughout the book or at some point in the book, she decides that in order to survive or in order to achieve what she wants to achieve, she has to basically disregard what the world thinks about her behavior. Um, and I partly write these characters because there's a strong element of that in me, and I partly write them because there's a strong opposite to that in me. So in real life, I am incredibly diplomatic. Um, I don't know why. I just know that I, you know, if somebody comes up to me and hits me on the head with a hammer, I will immediately say, oh, I'm terribly sorry that my, I hope my head didn't dent your hammer. I mean, you know, please tell me what I've done to annoy you. Um, I'm a real smoother o over. It's almost impossible to have an argument with me of any kind because I will always just say, oh, I'm, sh I'm sure you're right. And I mean, then I'll go off and secretly say, what an idiot, but I'm, I'm just very tactful. Um, but that takes its toll. If you constantly re repress, uh, you know, many people are incredibly unreasonable. So if you constantly repress your natural reactions, it has to come out somewhere. And I think mine comes out in these assertive characters who don't care what the world thinks of them and just do what they want anyway. But I, th I think that's something that's maybe more in my contemporary thrillers, but it is in the Poirots as well. So um, Margaret Ernst, the vicar's wife, She's really stroppy and opinionated, possibly more so than a, a real early 1900s vicar's wife might be, but I just thought, ah, oh, well, there might have been one vicar's wife like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was actually interested to, there seemed to be a real love-hate relationship between Christie and her character, because I was reading that by 1930, Agatha Christie found Poirot insufferable and that by 1960 she felt he was a detestable bombastic tiresome egocentric little creep <laughs> did you i mean I, i'm sure it's far too soon in your relationship with poirot for you to be do you be thinking that but do you i mean have there any elements of that attitude in in you um, no not at all I, I love poirot i don't find him tiresome i love all his little quirks i was actually quite taken aback when i first read that agatha had said that about him. Um, I suspect that she had an affection for him even while she was saying things like that. I think she was just maybe sounding off in a kind of affectionate, frustrated way. And I think possibly those words are taken out of context. I don't see how she could have written so many books about him throughout her life and made him so lovable in the books if she'd really disliked him. Uh, but no, I, I, you know, even what are meant to be his bad points, I think are great. You know, I love it when he boasts that he's cleverer than everyone, because he is. Um, and if you were as clever as him, you know, you would mention it occasionally, because he's so much cleverer than everyone else. And I love his fussiness, you know, when he straightens things on a mantelpiece or arranges cutlery. I actually really identify with that, because I'm a tidiness obsessive. Um, when I get home, after being away even for a night, um, the first thing I do is tidy the house. I can't have a cup of tea and sit down uh, because my husband and children always contrive to make the house look as if it's been squatted in by heroin addicts while I've been away. They can manage to do that even in half an hour. I don't quite know what they do. But I come back and it's like, wow, Johnny Rotten and Sid Vicious have obviously been here wrecking the place. So I go around straightening everything, tidying everything. Uh, so I can really relate to to that, And I also admire Poirot because even though he's surrounded by evil and the threat of great harm, he still finds time to have a nice dinner with some nice wine, which I think is important. I mean, his enduring appeal is amazing that Amazon have just bought the rights to several of Agatha, well, to Agatha Christie books. And also there's another murder on the Orient Express film that's being made. Um, why do, in some ways he is a very old-fashioned character and it's difficult to quite see the appeal in a very busy modern media environment why do you think he still seems to have resonance um i don't think he is a character that's i mean i know what you mean he is very much a sort of golden age of detection fiction detective fiction character but he's also timeless he's kind of He's so much himself. So when he appears in a novel in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, it's as if he's just been kind of 
dropped in, a bit like Mary Poppins, and he is Poirot. He will always be the same, whatever situation and time he's dropped into. So I think, in a way, he has a more timeless quality than a lot of time-specific detectives. Um, I mean, you notice, if you read all of Agatha's Poirot novels, that you rarely find out all that much about what he's been doing between the last one and this one. It's just, you know, there's a, there's a you know, hotel on, a, on an island with a beach. There, Poirot is on holiday. Uh, there's a country house where a murder's about to happen. Poirot's rented a cottage nearby. And you, he does appear in this sort of almost superhero way when he's needed. And he has very little backstory. Uh, you can read Agatha's Poirot novels in any order. There's no sense that, oh, well, hang on, had Poirot already got his new fridge freezer at that point? You know, there's no sort of cumbersome backstory at all. He's just there. Um, and I think that helps to make him feel timeless. Um, I mean, we're talking here in Hong Kong, obviously, and I'm interested in your take on the idea of literary brand names, because there's big fashion brand names that sell very well in China, obviously the Gucci's and the Versace's, and to some extent Poirot is the Chanel of detecting. Can you see the Christie family saying, yeah, let's set a Poirot novel in China to try and get that demographic, maybe 1930s Shanghai, if there was another four-year gap or something. Can you see, do you, what, I'm interested in your thoughts on the idea of literary brand names and whether they would actually work on, in Asia. Uh, well, I think Poirot is absolutely a brand, um, like Sherlock Holmes. You know, there are some characters, very few, but there are some, who kind of transcend the books they're in and their original author, and they are, they are as famous. I mean, Sherlock Holmes is more famous than Arthur Conan Doyle, actually. Um, and it's possible, I'm not sure, but it's possible that Poirot is more famous than Agatha Christie. Um, so the brand thing is already there. Now, the Poirot brand is an unusual one because unlike most series detectives, he appears in such a variety of stories, both in terms of setting and in terms of structure. So sometimes he's in London, sometimes he's in an English country village, sometimes he's you know in a hotel, posh hotel, sometimes he's in Mesopotamia um, on an archaeological dig. I mean... Again, just dropped in. Here I am on an archaeological dig. Um, so the, the settings vary, but also Poirot's role in the books varies hugely. So he, obviously he, he always solves the crime. That's kind of a given. That's a rule. Um, but there are some Poirot novels where he only appears for the last few chapters. Um, Cat Among the Pigeons, which is set in an English girls' boarding school, is you know a Poirot novel officially, but he's only in it for a couple of chapters at the end. Um, after the funeral, he appears halfway through. There's many where he doesn't make much of an appearance until later on. And I think, again, this was one of Agatha's responses to the fact that he was so overwhelmingly her most popular character and HarperCollins wanted more Poirot. That was, they kept saying to her, we want more Poirot, readers want more Poirot, Poirot's what sells. He is massively her best-selling character, far more than Miss Marple. And I think some of that anger she expresses about him and dislike for him, it's not about him. It's about the fact that in an ideal world, she wanted to write many different kinds of books. She was a very bright, ambitious, and intellectually curious woman who got bored doing the same thing over and over again. And I think she eventually thought, right... If they insist on more Poirot and a Poirot every year, I'm going to make it as interesting for myself as possible. And I'm going to even slightly stretch the rules as much as I can by seeing how little Poirot I can put into a Poirot novel and it still be a Poirot novel. Um, but yeah, absolutely, I think he is a brand. And in terms of settings for my Poirot novels, I, I decide so that the family are happy to let me... Um, make all the decisions. They, they, what I do is I write the plan of each book before I start writing it. I send it to them. If they want to make any suggestions of how the plot could be changed, then they will, and I'll take those on board. But, you know, it would, it, I'm the one who has to decide where to set the next prior novel. And the tricky thing is, 
you know, when I wrote Closed Casket, which is my second one, um, that is set in tr the traditional, you know, very Christie-like, big country mansion owned by an aristocrat. Um, everybody is under one roof. So the victim, all the suspects, the murderer, the detectives, they are all confined to the mansion. So you've got that sort of closed community vibe. And so many people have said, that's just so Agatha Christie. Yeah, that's much more Agatha Christie-ish than the monogram murders. And I always say, well, hang on a minute. Monogram murders is set in a London hotel and an English country village. That too is very Agatha Christie-ish. And if I decided to set the third Poirot novel in Switzerland or, or almost wherever, that too would be Agatha christie -ish because the thing about Agatha Christie is she did every possible conceivable thing with Poirot that she could. She had him in a card game, on a plane, on a boat, on a train, in a country house. I mean, she had him growing turnips or whatever, eat marrows in Roger Ackroyd. Um, but the frustrating thing is, well, actually, it's not that frustrating. I'm basically fine with it. But there are things that Agatha could do with Poirot that I can't. So I could have him in Hong Kong, that would be fine. I couldn't have him only in the last three chapters. Um, Agatha could, I can't, because my job is writing Poirot novels. I have to have Poirot in the novels very prominently. Or I should point out, I feel that. No one's ever said that to me, but I wouldn't try to exclude Poirot from Poirot novels in the way that Agatha occasionally did. I mean, you were talking about HarperCollins, and there was um, new correspondence that came out this week between Agatha Christie and Billy Collins, who's the Collins of HarperCollins. And I was quite struck by some of the things that she said. I mean, she talked about a publicity blur blurb and was saying, I don't like it at all, or was talking about the cover of a book, and it said, the pinky colour was more sentimental than murderous. And it just kind of made me think, we think of her as a very famous writer, but is she also somebody who you know, could be, should be a real role model for a successful woman who is also not unhappy to express disapproving opinions. Absolutely. Um, I mean, one thing, I actually saw that exhibition of her letters, the, the correspondence between her and Billy Collins, um, which is currently being exhibited at the Harrogate Crime Festival, and I was there on Saturday. Uh, so I went and read all the letters that were on boards in the garden. And she is just so impressive. I mean, I don't only love her as a writer, I love her as an all-round person because she, you know, she was so interested in the business side of her books. And I really admire that. I cannot tell you how many writers kind of just don't want to know anything. You know, they act as though the production and sale of their books is some mystical thing and they must never look behind the curtain or it might affect their inspiration. I mean, I've literally had writers say to me, well, what, if I say, you know, oh, I was in London to discuss the marketing plan for the new book, and they go, oh, do you have to do that? Do your publishers force you? I'm like, no, I'm about to put a product out there. I want to be involved in the marketing plan. Um, and a few, a few years back, I, I did a blog post saying, Publishers get sales figures every week, so they know what their books have sold. Authors routinely don't get those sales figures. I do, because my publishers know I like to see them. Um, but I did a blog post saying, why don't all authors just get these, pu these sales figures, like publishers do? And authors shouted at me. I mean, not they didn't shout. But so many authors said, no, no, no. Please don't encourage publishers to send me my sales figures. I'm like, but... Why not? How can you not want to know? So, so I really am impressed by Agatha, especially when, when, you know, at the time she was writing these letters. She was always very polite, but she was assertive. If she thought a, a jacket or a title or something didn't work, she said so. Mm. And she said it in a tone wh that was clear she expected to be listened to, you know. And, and she and Billy Collins were great friends, so they were very honest with each other in a way that modern publishing would just find bizarre. So, you know, she said to him, the cover is absolutely terrible. Please do better and send me another version. But he also felt free to say to her, Agatha, your latest author photo makes you look about 90 and you're only 60. Please send a more flattering one. And neither of them was offended. Whereas contemporary publishing has so gone in the other direction. I mean, if, if you loathe a jacket 
so much that you cry for two hours, you would never write to your publisher and say, I loathe the jacket. You would write and say, I really like many elements of the jacket, but I was just wondering if we could tweak it ever so slightly into something entirely different. You know, you would always do it in that way. And, you know, similarly, your editor, if they read the new manuscript and think, she's absolutely gone bonkers, this is a pile of drivel, they will never write that. They will say, absolutely love what you're trying to do with the new book. Could you maybe just do a light edit that turns it into not a terrible book? You know, it's all done in this very polite way. So I, I found it refreshing to see <laughs> the relationship between Agatha and Billy, and neither of them was phased by the honesty of the other one at all. Um, I want to ask you about another famous female author that you cited in a newspaper article. You were asked what drew you to crime and psychology, and you said... As a child, I discovered Enid Blyton's Secret Seven. <laughs> I love the idea of Blyton being a crime writer. Was, was she an early she inspiration? Is. She absolutely is. A, a, yeah, I mean, there were crimes in her books, and she's a suspense writer. Is she popular here? Do people know about Enid Blyton? She, for me, was the children's book version of Agatha Christie, and I really think you could make a strong case for that. So she has that talent that Christie had of just you start reading and whatever mood you're in, whatever else you were doing, you're just gripped. Uh, I recently bought some of the Secret Seven mysteries for my nephew who's eight. Um, and I thought, I'm just gonna reread them without bending the spine before I give them to him. Um, just to see whether, you know, clearly I'm not seven anymore, so maybe they'll seem a bit... I was totally hooked, even though the crime at stake was like, you know, who's stolen the mailbag from the post train. Um, I was like, oh, are they going to get the, the culprit? And they are just so hooky and addictive, and I, I really do think she is, you know, the gateway drug to Agatha. Um, <laughs> and I think what they have in common, both of them, is that they prioritise great storytelling over everything else. They just want the reader to be hooked and having fun and in suspense, and it shows. You know, you can tell when you read a book by a writer whose main priority is not you having fun. I constantly start books by writers who don't particularly care if I'm having fun because they want to describe the socio-economic conditions in downtown Scunthorpe. I'm like, I don't care that you want to describe that. I want to have some fun. Where is my fun? Uh, with Agatha Christie and Enid Blyton, they give you that fun all the time, so you don't need to worry about that. Do you think the world will ever get Agatha fatigue? I mean, I was noticing there was even a new production of Witness for the Pro Prosecution that's going to be on in London this year. Yeah. And there was a production of one of her plays here in Shangwa in, in Hong there Kong. Do you think that there's ever going to be a point where Christie, Agatha Christie feels outdated or is that is it not going to happen? I, I don't think so because she, she's just, she, she writes, so with this, she, she's got this kind of magic, ability, and I really do think it's almost like magic, to just distill down to the essence of human experience. So, eight characters in a house. I mean, okay, they might be in a house in the 1920s, but you sort of feel as though they're just people like people are now. And they might not talk in the way that we talk exactly, but it's almost like they're, they're such powerful archetypes, her plots and her characters. I do think they will be always popular, just like I think Shakespeare's plays will always be read and, you know, um, Emily Dickinson's poetry. I think people, writers that are that great, they have some strong archetypal elements that will always appeal to people. And before we open up to questions from the audience, I just want to ask you one last thing, which is when you went back to your desk to write as you, and I know that you're working on other stuff, um, I was reading about Haven't They Grown, which seemed like a very interesting premise. Did you feel that the way you were writing had changed at all? Was there any different timbre to it? Did it have a Belgian accent? Was there anything <laughs> that felt slightly different after being Agatha Christie? Um... I think what, what was really interesting was that I was just much more aware of the choices I could make with every book I wrote. So before I was asked to write Poirot novels, I just assumed that what I wrote was contemporary psychological thrillers 
after I'd written the first Poirot novel, and then I thought, right, what, what's my next novel gonna, going to be? I thought, well, I've now, I now write two different kinds of crime novels. That means if I wanted to, I could write a third kind. And it made me much more conscious of my choices. And in fact, um, the next book I wrote immediately after the monogram murders was my first ever standalone contemporary thriller, which I think might be the best book I've ever written. Obviously, I'm the last person who can judge that, so don't, whatever you do, listen to me. Um, but I, I think it might be. It's called A Game for All the Family, a standalone psychological thriller. And what I decided I wanted to do in that book was actually blend a very contemporary psychological thriller. So it's a story of a woman who moves from London to Devon, the countryside. As soon as she gets there, sinister things start to happen, and it becomes clear that somebody is trying to kill her and her family, but she has no hidden secrets, she has no skeletons in the closet, she is literally a blameless person. There is no reason why anybody should target her. So that's the mystery, the contemporary mystery. Interwoven with that is a very Baroque and almost Christie-like, almost Golden Age-like, murder mystery, which the heroine's daughter is apparently writing for a school project, but is she? She may be writing it for some other reason. And this is a very Baroque murder mystery set in the new house that they've just moved to. And in the end, and this isn't a spoiler, the two are interwoven all the way through, and in the end, the heroine realizes that the only way she can save herself and her family is by solving the mystery in the story her daughter is writing. So I'm a real structure freak, so I, I love that structure, but I deliberately put a sort of contemporary style thriller and a Baroque Christie-esque kind of ingenious murder mystery in the same book. Um, and I don't think I would have had the idea to do that if I hadn't written in those two styles previously. That's really interesting. Well, um I've asked enough, I think, for the time being. Are there any questions from the audience? What would you like to ask, Sophie? Um, yes, lady with the lovely green top. Just wait for the microphone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I'm a huge fan of oh. your uh, uh, of Monogram Murders and also previous Agatha Christie books. And I'm not sure about uh, your deal with the Christie family, but um, we will be writing books about other detectives like Miss Marple or even Harlequin or Parker Pine. Um, and also if that wouldn't happen, would you try to incorporate those minor but repetitive characters like uh, Countess Roscoff and yeah, also the secretary or um, maybe even um, his butler or something? <laughs> yeah. Yes, well George the valet is going to be in the next one, definitely. Um, I don't know about Miss Lemon, maybe maybe Miss Lemon, but definitely George. Um, when it was announced that I was writing a Poirot novel, the first question everyone asked was, are you going to do Miss Marple as well? And I immediately said no, because I just sort of felt that, you know, taking on Poirot felt like such a big deal, and I wanted to do him justice. And I felt it would be weird. So if I'm just writing continuation Poirot novels and my other crime novels, that feels kind of comfortable. If I'm writing Miss Marple and Poirot, then my claim that I'm not trying to be Agatha Christie looks a little bit weaker, you know? Um, and I kind of think if, if the family do decide they want more Marple novels, which I would love as a reader, I think it would be better and more sort of fitting if they asked someone else to do those, and then someone else again maybe to do Tommy and Tuppence or Mr. Quinn or Parker Pine. I sort of feel that because Agatha is the best-selling queen of crime, great legend that she is, it's better if lots of different writers get to carry on that legacy and not just me. Um, so I said no to Miss Marple quite a long time ago, uh, which is just about the only time I've ever exerted any willpower or self-control because I do really love the idea. I mean, I, I would love to write a Miss Marple novel, but I sort of feel I shouldn't because that would be too, 
too much, um, which is very unlike me. Normally, I'm a total hedonist and just do exactly what I want, but I just sort of felt, no, it would be wrong. But I really hope that somebody writes a new Miss Marple because I'd love to read it. She's a great character. And she is Agatha's version of herself. She, and I just think she's so... I love Mrs. Oliver for her observations about what it's like to be a writer. You know, she's constantly saying, oh, I have to go and talk to the Women's Institute. I don't know why they want me to talk to them. They want to know what it's like to be a writer, but actually, I've no idea what it's like for anyone but me, and why on earth would they want to listen to me going on? About it? And you can just tell that that's Agatha's own feelings about the sort of public life of being a writer. Um, so she's a great character, but... No, I mean, I think if, if the family want any of the other characters to be continued, Miss Marple would be top of the list. I mean, I think Miss Marple and Poirot are clearly Agatha's greatest fictional creations. Any other questions from the audience for Sophie? Gentleman at the back. Um, hi. Uh, you hi. talked about there being a blueprint for Agatha Christie novels. Um, so I just wanted to ask how you went about figuring out that blueprint, and how would you describe that blueprint to be? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I didn't really so much, I, I didn't sort of sit down and think, what are the elements? It was more that as soon as my agent rang me and started even talking about the possibility of me writing Poirot novels, I just kind of became aware that I knew it, it was just something I'd never thought about before, but once I thought about it, the knowledge was there just from reading um, so many uh, Christie novels. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of elements. One element is uh, that really outlandish, extra mysterious, impossible-seeming plot hook where the reader not only doesn't know what's happened but can't imagine what could possibly lead to this thing that they're observing at the beginning of the book. So that's one thing. Um, another element is the detachable concept. Um, so Agatha was a huge, uh, well, in fact, she was possibly the first person to do it, but many of her best books are based on a brilliant detachable concept which you could say to somebody and without knowing anything else about the book, they could go, oh, wow, that's really clever. Um, so I don't want to give anything away, but for example, I'm sure many of you know the solution in Murder on the Orient Express, um, and I'm sure many of you know the solution in The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. You could literally say to people, there's this crime novel, and it turns out that, and four words later, everybody would be in a position to go, oh, wow, that's a really clever idea. But both Orient Express and Roger Ackroyd's solutions, because they're both ideas for the solution. Both of those solutions could be attached to any number of stories. The concept of the solution of Murder on the Orient Express doesn't have to be the solution of a murder on a train. You know, it could be set in a, a, a dentist surgery uh, with all the patients and the other dentists and the receptionists. Uh, same with Murder of Roger Ackroyd. You could have that clever solution concept attached to any number of stories. So Agatha was a huge fan of the detachable, high-concept idea. Um, so that was a, that's another very important thing. Um, and in fact, one of the things I was so excited about before I started writing Closed Casket was that I had one of those Agatha-ish, detachable concept ideas. I had an idea. The idea was a motive for murder. It could be expressed in four words. It was so simple and almost obvious, and yet I knew it had never been done and that no one would guess it. And it was just like, it just felt like the holy grail of crime novel ideas. I literally felt as if Agatha had opened my head from on high and dropped the idea in. It felt so Agatha-ish. Um, so that's another thing she does. Um, she flaunts the clues. So most crime writers, they know they have to put the clues in um, because otherwise they're not playing fair with the reader, but they try and distract you. So they'll kind of go, look over there, now I'll put this clue in. Agatha, over and over again, has her detective saying, think about it. Think about the footprint in the flower bed, the wax on the candle, the blonde wig, and the beef bourguignon. 
And think of all those things in that order. Now surely you can see the explanation. And then usually Hastings or someone dimmer than Poirot will go, no, 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 I still can't see. And the reader at that point is thinking, okay, she's telling me now these are the clues and I need to think about them in this order and I still can't get it. So that's real storytelling confidence and hardly anybody does that. Agatha does it over and over again. She says, come on, here you are, I'm giving you another chance. You're still not going to get it, but here are all the clues. Um, so those are three things. Um, an obsession with tiny details and language-based clues. One of her books, The Whole Key to Unraveling the Mystery, turns on the difference between the definite article and the indefinite article. So, a uh, and the. Um, and so often it's the tiniest of details that lead to all the, all the revelations. Um, so, so those are just four examples. The, the puzzle-based mystery. Because lots of crime novels aren't puzzle-based mysteries. Um, I often get very disappointed when I start a crime novel and it turns out that the writer's not interested in a puzzle. The writer's interested in you know, realistic gangland drug dealers shooting each other uh, and I mean, that's fine for people who like that, but I'm not massively interested in drug dealers shooting each other because it's not mysterious. I kind of know why drug dealers might shoot each other already. So, you know, I'm not going to be on the edge of my seat wanting to find that out. Uh, so that puzzle thing is really strong. Um, another little silly thing, the way she names her characters. Her characters have the most extraordinary elaborate, extraordinarily elaborate names, like... Ankatel and um, what's Cora? Cora in After the Funeral. I can't even remember her name, but it's about 20 syllables long. Her, her last name begins with a D. Um, and in most of her books, you will find she, she has as many characters as possible having really kind of interesting and unusual names. And that really adds to the, the texture of the books. I actually just want to pick up on that in terms of blueprints for crimes. I noticed that you did an event earlier this month at a prison in yes. England. And I'm yeah. very curious about A, what you talked about, and B, what you were asked. Were people asking for plotting details so they could avoid <laughs> getting caught next time? <laughs> no, I mean, mo most... I do occasionally do events in prisons. Um, and I actually really like doing them because the the prisoners are always really interested. You know what I mean? It's partly because, obviously, you know, they don't get much in the way of entertainment, but they are really interested and they ask loads of questions. But the kind of crimes I write about are not the kind of crimes they're in for. Most of them are not mysterious. They didn't do a cryptic and brilliant thing. I mean, I can remember vividly... I mean, now I'm kind of used to it, but when I first started going into prisons, and I can remember this one man... I'd, I'd ask them all to do a poetry exercise because at that point I wasn't actually writing crime I was just a poet in those days and uh, this man had written a poem about his wife it was clearly full of all kinds of pain and anxiety and so I was trying to just talk about the poem and he said just sort of as an aside he said yeah you know I'm actually in here because I, I killed my wife so <laughs> I was like oh, oh right you know what do you say to that um so I kind of felt I had to say something because he, he'd volunteered this information that he'd killed his wife. So I kind of said a more tactful version of, why did you do that? And I'll never forget, he just looked really kind of almost bemused and he just literally said, don't know, wish I hadn't done it now. It was just like really horrifying. Um, and that actually made me think, you know, all the crime novels I was reading at the time where people have these cryptic kind of, you know, they've got these big plans and these weird motives. Most crime, most prisoners are in prison because they've lashed out while drunk or they've done something to do with drugs or they're career criminals who that's just their job. They rob stuff, you know, or commit fraud. Um, but no, it was really interesting. But I find it hard going into prisons because I always, you know, the... When you meet these prisoners, it's kind of clear that a lot of them, not that they didn't have any alternative but to be criminals, but, you know, that a lot of them are have such low literacy levels. Um, and you can, you can sort of look at them and think, that person wouldn't have had 
any idea about what else to do apart from either be a criminal or just be kind of trapped in poverty forever. And I mean, I can relate to that. You know, when I was growing up, the kind of world I lived in, if you wanted to, you know, do something exciting and make money, you, you, you know, published a book or, you know, that felt like a possibility. Yeah. Um, but the kind of world a lot of these men are coming from, they don't have that option. Um, anyway, I always get carried away when I go into a prison. So <laughs> I was in this prison and the guys, you know, they were really interested and there was, there's loads of them. There's like 1300 men in this prison. And I happened just to have written my first ever murder mystery musical. So I just said, how would you guys feel about putting on a musical? And, you know, because they're in prison, normally when I say, I say that to everybody, do you want to put on a musical? They're like, no, no, leave, leave me out of your musical. Um, but these guys were like, yeah. And, and some of them started being really like, oh, yeah, I'm a good actor, I'm a good singer. And I said to the woman who'd invited me in, could we put on a musical in this prison? Would they be allowed to invite their family in to watch it? So she immediately started saying, oh, well, the governor's very this and very that. You'd have to speak to the governor. So now I'm gearing up to speak to a governor. But last time I tried to speak to a prison governor, it didn't go very well. This was another poetry thing I'd done in Devise's prison. And I just wanted to be allowed to take the prisoners out of the prison for one evening to come and do an event with me at the Devises Poetry Festival. And then I just wanted to take them out for a curry afterwards. And the governor would not let me take them out of the prison for the evening, which I guess was fair enough, because he was going, you wouldn't be able to get them all back on the bus after the curry. And I was going, oh, I'm sure I would. You know, we'd just have a nice evening and then we'd all come back. But he was like, no, that's not happening. Um, so after that, I didn't get invited to any prisons for a while. I think I was widely regarded as being a soft touch. <laughs> um, any other questions that anybody would like to, to pose of Sophie? Oh, it, oh, yeah, one more. You mentioned the TV, but you didn't mention the movies. So I was wondering if I could get your opinions on who was your favourite program. Um... Not including David Suchet. I mean, I think David Suchet is my favourite screen Poirot. Um, after him, if we're just talking about the movies, I did really love the Albert Finney version of Murder on the Orient Express. I thought that particular film um, really made the most of the revelation when you realise that the, the solution is something that's been possible all along, but you just don't think of it because it's so daring and so audacious. And actually, that revelation, that kind of, oh, wow, it's this, is actually made more of in the Albert Finney film than in the book. That's one of my little quibbles about the book of Murder on the Orient Express. It's such a clever solution, and I think it needs to be introduced in a much more grand guignol kind of way and the film really does that so i'm hoping the new version with kenneth branner will do that as well um talking of which can you clear up a mystery for me kenneth branner was talking about how his mustache in that film was so large he had to rent he wanted to have a, you know, a separate rented room for it what kind of mustache does poro have and why in a world where there's like a Tom Selleck and a Dali moustache, do we not have a Poirot moustache? Um, well, I mean, the, the super fans, as the, as the extreme, the Agatha extremists are known, have been up in arms about Kenneth Branagh's moustache, uh, partly because of its shape, partly because of its greyness. Apparently in one of the books, Poirot says he would never let his moustache go grey. Um, but I think Kenneth Branagh had his reasons. I mean, Kenneth Branagh's really put a lot of effort and dedication into it. So I'm sure he has his reasons, but I just think it's hilarious that the moustache in the new film is creating such controversy. There was even a defense of the Branner moustache published on the official Agatha Christie website. Um, and I was like, oh, wow. This is, what, this is what it's come to. We're now having whole articles defending a moustache. In my head, his moustache looks like David Suchet's, but maybe a bit bigger. Yeah. Uh, the books do emphasize over and over again that it is a very flamboyant mustache. And the one that Kenneth Branagh has is kind of like an imperial one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it kind, it of, go, it kind of goes into the side of his ear. <laughs> but I mean, for me, that's not the main 
point. Like, I, as long as the story is communicated effectively and keeps all its key elements, I don't mind so much about the moustache. I mean, I, I think I personally would have chosen to have a black moustache. I don't so much mind the shape, but I don't see why it's grey. But I mean, you know, I, I leave that to Kenneth Branner. I'm sure he has very good, valid reasons. <laughs> there was a question there? Yeah. You may have touched on this earlier, but out of all of the Agatha Christie novels, which one do you think is the most genius work or her best? That is a really difficult question because there are different ones which are brilliant in different ways. So it's very hard to pick just one. I mean, I think And Then There Were None in many, many ways stands out as her sort of real masterpiece. Having said that, I, it does have a tiny flaw, in my opinion, that could easily have been dealt with. So for me, that slightly detracts, because otherwise it is so perfect. But that would have to be up there in the top five. Murder on the Orient Express would have to be up there in the top five because of its genius solution. My personal favourite at the moment is The Hollow, which is nobody else's favourite. Uh, and I found out after rereading it recently, and I, I read it, and it just had such an effect on me, I thought... This is my favourite. So I tweeted about it. And lots of people then tweeted me and said, um, did you know Agatha always was unhappy about that novel and she always regretted putting Poirot in it because it was much more of a kind of... It, it wasn't so tightly structured in the sort of classic detective story mould. It was much more like a novel about some characters that happened to contain a murder mystery. So it had a slightly looser structure. Um, but I thought it worked brilliantly with Poirot in it. Um, and it's, it's one of her books where the balance between all the elements is right. So the characters are amazing. The setting is great. The writing is great. Even the minor characters are just so strong and, and make a real impression. Uh, and Poirot features in it slightly differently because clearly, you know, when you know that, that he was a last-minute add-on, you can sort of see it. But it still works brilliantly and has a really surprising ending. So that, that's my current number one. But it may change. <laughs> Any others? Well, in that case, I think I just want to ask you finally, can you explain your Poirot schedule ahead and your Sophie Hanna schedule ahead with the, the next novels that you're, you're writing and when they're going to be coming out? Yes, yeah, so um, the, ne the next novel of mine that's coming out uh, is in late August and that is a standalone psychological thriller, contemporary, called Did You See Melody? Uh, and that is my first ever book to be set in a five-star spa resort, uh, which I'm very excited about because I love five-star spa resorts. Um, but that is, uh, the heroine is a, an English woman, wife and mother, who at the beginning of the book, she's kind of run away from home. You don't know why. And she's taken a large chunk of the family savings to splash on this really expensive spa resort. So she arrives at this resort in the middle of the night the receptionist gives her a key to her room. She goes to her room and finds it's already occupied. And the receptionist has mistakenly sent her to an already occupied room. So she thinks this is just, you know, embarrassing encounter in the middle of the night, goes and gets a different room. The next day, she realizes that the teenage girl that she saw in that hotel room in the middle of the night is actually the most famous murder victim in the country whose parents are currently serving life sentences for her murder. And she alone, Cara, the protagonist alone, now knows that this girl is apparently not dead. So that, that's the premise uh, for Did You See Melody? And I'm just about to start writing the next Poirot, which will come out next September. And then I'm writing another standalone psychological thriller um, called Haven't They Grown? And that one won't have a question mark. So Did You See Melody has a question mark, which I'm very proud of. It's my first ever title with a question mark. Um, Haven't They Grown won't have a question mark, partly because I just don't want to do too many question marks one after another, but also because the way in which the phrase is relevant to the book is more a kind of rhetorical... You know when you see your friend's children after a long time and you say, oh, haven't they grown? You don't really want an answer, whereas did you see Melody? 
you do want an answer. So, so that's why there's no question mark for haven't they grown. Okay, well, from punctuation to Poirot, thank you so much for your company tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>